Salut, hi everyone, uh, thanks for being here. Uh, merci d'avoir participé à la conférence. Uh, la présentation va avoir lieu en anglais. S'il y en a parmi vous qui veulent poser des questions en français à la fin de la présentation, vous êtes aussi bienvenus de le faire. Uh, thanks uh, Cindy for accepting to present today. Uh, for those who don't know Cindy, she has been with the city of Greater Sudbury since 2004. She has held a variety of roles in human resources and in the, and the community development department where she is currently, she is currently employed as manager of housing services. Um, merci à toi Claude pour cette initiative, ça va sûrement nous éclairer sur les options de, de logement à Sudbury. Claude was born in Switzerland, where he worked as a molecular biologist and now lives in Toronto, works as a bicycle mechanic and in performance art, has performed in festivals and curated events in self-produced pieces and in the public spaces. Um, je t'invite maintenant, Claude, si tu veux partager, if you want to talk about your, your project with us before we start with, uh, with Cindy. Thank you. Thank you. Um... I'll be short, I don't have very much to say. I think I'll start by saying that I identify as a white settler. I very often feel I live on stolen land, especially since I'm a first generation immigrant, uh, currently citizen as well. Um, I also identify as a trans man um, who came out late and as an invisibly disabled person. Uh, recipient of the Ontario Disability Support Program. You might be surprised that this is part of my identification, but it has wired my brain, so it's part of it. I also identify as a performance artist, and um, this might be surprising, but today's event is a typical example of my art at this moment. So I, I just want to explain this. Um, up until 2017, my art was happening in studios, galleries, festivals, and I performed mostly investigations around gender identity. And that was basically forming small communities that were kind of like ephemeral, right? Like there is a small transformation on stage and it's beautiful, everybody's happy, goes home, and has learned something about being a trans or thinking about it. And in, during a crisis in 2000, 2017, I realized, oh, like this is this is just like those small communities would never survive or hold a real crisis. And I started to think, I want art to be able to actually hold such a crisis, and I want to try to find like a long-term community. So I started to try to do real life gestures that would address my survival. And today is a gesture that addresses long-term survival. The real, real survival performance today would be an appointment with a doctor, but you know that would be the short term, right? So the long term is this housing because I feel in very precarious situation. And I extend with this gesture, I try to extend um, the, the thinking that art can can hold this type of survival, especially for artists. Um, and, you know, like, ironically, I might be right now just exploring solidarity. I don't know. So all this is sufficient to be said. And um, I'm very happy that, that other people have joined today. And I hope that we can stay together after for just a little bit to speak about this, this art and long-term solidarity. Um, so now I'm going to give the word to Cindy and thank you, Cindy, again for being here and being part of this art event. Thank you very much, Claude. I appreciate uh, the, uh, the, the smooth handoff uh, from one uh, speaker to another. Thank you very much. So um, I'd like to thank you all very much for allowing me to speak today as it relates to uh, social uh, community housing, affordable housing. It's a, one kind of blends into the other. Um, my role here at the City of Greater Sudbury is Manager of Housing Services. I oversee uh, two sections. Uh, one is the housing registry, which is the section where applicant households uh, will make application for rent geared to income housing. Um, so that's one component. And the other is uh, our program section that deals with actual 
nonprofits, co-ops, affordable housing buildings, um, rent supplement buildings, which is uh, rent through private landlords. Uh, so that's the other side of, of business that we have here in housing services is the programs component in which uh, we uh, fund uh, partial uh, uh, subsidies to uh, these nonprofits and co-ops, as well as ensure that they are in compliance with uh, the provincial legislation. Back in 2001, the province of Ontario downloaded social housing to 47 municipalities across the province. So as of uh, that decade, uh, Ontario became the one and only province across the country where uh, social housing was, um, was now a municipal responsibility. In all other provinces and territories, uh, as it continues to date, uh, it, it's a provincial priority and a provincial responsibility. So Ontario is very unique uh, in, in that um, this, the, the social housing uh, stock as well as the administration of the stock um, uh, is now a municipal responsibility. Back in 2001, when these um, assets were uh, downloaded, there was also funding that was provided to the municipalities. So our budgets at that point in time were about 80% provincial and 20% uh, would uh, actually become a municipal uh, responsibility and would affect the, the tax levy. In 2021, we're looking at a reversal of that rule whereby um, the municipalities are now paying approximately 80% uh, and affects our, our tax base and the provinces are contributing uh, only 20% or, or less to date. So um, the funding model has changed drastically over the years. Uh, the only thing that has not changed uh, is the legislation and the parameters around uh, the provincial uh, regulations that uh, municipalities must follow in order to be in compliance. So when people are looking at, at applying for social housing or for rent geared to income housing, uh, the City of Greater Sudbury's website offers uh, really excellent information. When you are uh, going to uh, www.greatersudbury.ca, um, there's a search little uh, hour or a little magnifying glass at the top where you would search community housing. And once you get there, you go into housing services, which is the left-hand side of the, uh, of the web page. I will be providing uh, this handout uh, at the end uh, to Laura, and then she can uh, absolutely uh, distribute it amongst everyone. So you will have this information in a hard copy. There are two ways to make application at the city. You can go online and, and, um, and uh, sign up online, or you can uh, print off the documentation required and submit it uh, via email, via post, or in person if you actually reside in the city of Greater Sudbury. We have a drop box downstairs at 199 Larch that you can drop off all the information. In order to be eligible for a uh, subsidy, you must be 16 years of age or older. You must be a Canadian citizen, landed immigrant, or have approved refugee status by the Government of Canada. And you cannot have any outstanding arrears with any social housing properties across the province of Ontario. So if you do have, if you've left a social, if you lived in social housing previously and you left with unpaid rent or damages to the unit, uh, those um, those dollars need to be cleared up before you are allowed to get back on the uh, on the wait list. Mm. So that is that's a provincially legislated mandate which we have no uh, wiggle room on. Uh, as I indicated at the onset, we are we are essentially all forty seven service managers across the province are are essentially middlemen in this process. Uh, the pro province provides. Uh, a component of funding. They provide all of the regulations, and and as um, as uh, service managers, it is our role to to comply with those uh, with those regulations. Our wait lists vary. Um, back in 2017, we had uh, we completed a social housing revitalization plan because we knew that there was a, a mismatch between the demand and supply. So we had a great demand for one bedroom units, probably about 75% of the wait list were uh, applicant households uh, waiting for a one bedroom. 
and our and our actual stock is about 40 percent so there was a huge huge mismatch and a huge huge waiting time because until a vacancy occurs our wait list does not move and with the pandemic it has really really stalled uh, the, the process simply because people are not moving out. People are staying put and they're not leaving. So our wait list has grown as a result of, of the pandemic and, um, you know, with people not moving out of their units. Can you just, Cindy, I'm sorry, I'm just, can you just say how many people are on the wait list and how many units you have so that we have an image? Right. So when I talk about people, I, I can't talk about people. I talk about applicant households. We don't talk in people. So an applicant household may be one person or it could be eight people. So, so you can't really determine the difference simply because uh, our stock varies. One bedroom, two bedroom, up to five bedroom. It's, we've got apartments, townhouses, semi-detached, scattered units. They come in all varieties, shapes, sizes, forms high rises, uh, walk ups. So we have a very uh, a varying degree of stock here. There's about 4,625 units across the, uh, across the city. Our wait list right now is just uh, under a thousand applicant households, but that's not people. Again, one applicant household could be six people. So, um, but the greatest demand, as I indicated, is for uh, one bedroom units. So again, the application form that you could complete, the paper form is available on PDF on our website. Um, it's available downstairs in, our, uh, in the lobby of 199 Larch Street. We have a bookshelf with all our forms on it. It is available there. Or you can choose to use the online um, uh, portal where you would just complete this entire application uh, online. There's tons of information. It's a, it's a lengthy document, but a lot of it is information. When you actually look at what needs to be filled out, there's probably about six pages that need to be filled out out of about, uh, I'm going to say about 20, but most of it is information. So I did receive some questions from the group that I will uh, now move forward to answer. So the first question is, how many units of community housing does Greater Sudbury have and how many people are on the centralized wait list? And Claude, you have just raised this question. So 4,625 units and uh, just under 1,000. Um, is Greater Sudbury building more units or planning to do so? So currently we have um, a 14 unit seniors building that is in the process of being constructed. It's on Spark Street in New Sudbury. And this building will consist of one bedroom rent geared to income units. So this, these 14 units will be added to our stock uh, once uh, occupancy is, uh, is determined. How long on average does it take for somebody waiting for a one bedroom or a bachelor uh, apartment to get an offer? So first of all, we've got very, very few bachelors. I can say probably under five in our portfolio. Uh, we don't have many. So the waiting time varies from three to 10 years, depending on the applicant selection. Uh, some applicants may have a small number of household preferences requiring specific modifications, et cetera. It's mostly based on location. Some buildings are more popular than others. So we will have those buildings that will have wait lists that are longer than 10 years, uh, unfortunately. Um, what happens when one gets an offer? So under the Housing Services Act 2011, applicants only have one valid offer of accommodation. Up until July of 2020, previous to that, people would uh, receive three offers. And on the third offer, if they refused, then their file was canceled. Uh, the province changed that last July. Now it's one offer. If you refuse, your application is canceled. Um, when an applicant gets an offer from a housing provider and accepts, his or her application with the registry is closed and the applicant deals directly with the housing provider for rent geared to income calculation and the move-in process. The housing provider will initiate the contact. So all offers of housing come from the housing providers and not the registry. So that's one point that I just wanted to make really clear. A lot of folks think that the registry is, is the uh, group that makes the offers and that's not the case. We hold the wait list. The actual housing provider will uh, offer the unit. If the applicant refuses an offer of accommodation, his or her application with their housing registry is canceled. 
If the applicant wishes to remain on the wait list for another location, he or she will have to reapply to the housing register and will be giving a new chronological date. Failure to return a telephone message or respond to an email within three business days is considered a refusal of offer. So that's, um, yeah. We have to keep the file moving forward if people choose not to call back. It's all about choices, right? Housing is all about choices. If you receive a telephone call and you have a message that you need to return, if you have an email, uh, you know, what will happen is you will receive a telephone call, a message will be left, and you will also receive an email. So you will be contacted via two means. If you do not return the call or email within that, um, that three-day time frame, then uh, it's considered a refusal. Are the properties managed by the employees of the housing registry? Uh, no, no. The, the, the registry staff simply look after the wait list. So they talk to applicant households about the wait list. They assist applicant households when they want to make changes to their file, if they want to add selections, take selections off. If they've moved, um, Technically, you have 30 days to notify the registry of any change of information or household composition. So if your phone number changes, if your address changes, if one of your family members move out and now your household composition has changed, this information needs to be relayed to the uh, registry within a 30 day time frame. If that doesn't happen, again, you could miss an offer if you're not giving us uh, up to date information that the housing providers have no way of contacting you. So it's, it's critical that the registry is kept informed of any changes uh, as it relates to your, uh, your household composition. So it's the responsibility of the housing registry to administer the centralized wait list and determine eligibility for community housing. Each housing provider is governed by a board of directors and each housing provider has a property manager or a property management company overseeing the day-to-day -day operations. And those are, the, those are the folks that would make the calls when they have a, a vacant unit. We don't know when vacancies occur. The only way that we know is that they will call us and say, we're making an offer to the next individual on our wait list. So we will then put that file on offer. Uh, and then uh, the housing provider calls the individual. Uh, once they have a response, a yes or no, they will touch base with the, with the registry again and say, and let us know that that applicant has either accepted or refused the unit. So that's, that's how we, we maintain our system. How exactly are the rents calculated? What line of the tax return is, will be used to calculate the rent? So for households, <clears throat> excuse me, with employment income or pensions, rent is calculated at 30% of a household's annual family net income. So this is based on line 23600 of the household members previous year's tax returns. The rents for households receiving social assistance, Ontario Works or ODSP are indicated in the social assistance rent scales in Ontario Regulation 316-19 of the Housing Services Act 2011. So there's an actual rent scale that we must follow um, if someone is on Ontario Works or ODSP. It's really important to understand that the, there is specific documentation required when you are making application. Um, for instance, um, um, the, again, the province has, has changed as of last year that notice of assessments that people's income tax must be completed in order for them to be eligible to apply. <clears throat> Excuse me. So you, we would require the notice of assessment um, if uh, child tax benefit, if applicable, if there's children. Uh, birth certificates of all individuals uh, who are making application, uh, bank statements of the, um, of the primary uh, applicants, and then if there are any custody orders in place, we would also need a copy of that. So th that's the type of documentation, again, that is legislated for us to request um, when individuals are uh, making application. The next question, how do rent scales work for people on social assistance and will they continue to be used? So the amount of rents payable based on the social assistance rent scales are legislated amounts. The amount depends on the type of social assistance, the household size, and if the household many members have any other sources of income because some folks do work part-time, they may have uh, some form of uh, other uh, source of income um, that needs to be um, considered. 
<clears throat> Does Greater Sudbury offer the Canada Ontario Housing Benefit, also known as COB? And if so, does it also ask people to remove themselves from the waiting list? So the, greater, the city of Greater Sudbury does offer uh, the, the Canada Ontario housing benefit. Uh, the recipients of this benefit are removed from the uh, wait list as this is a requirement of the provincial program. So again, this is legislated by the province. If an individual does accept uh, this portable housing benefit, then they are also um, acknowledging that they will be removed from the, from the centralized wait list. So how is the Canada Ontario housing benefit calculated? It depends on the recipient's source of income. For example, if the recipient is on OW or ODSP, the assistance is based on the difference between the average market rent, which is uh, calculated by uh, Canada Mortgage and Housing Corporation, and the shelter portion of the social assistance. For recipients with other sources of income, such as employment income or pensions, the assistance is based on the difference between 80% of the average market rent and 30% of the recipient's gross monthly income. To give you an idea, the 2021 average market rent for a one bedroom unit in Greater Sudbury is $921. In order to qualify for COB, one must be eligible and must be on the um, our centralized wait list. Cindy, Cindy. I didn't understand whether for ODSP and Ontario Works recipient, it was 100% AMR minus the shelter allowance or 80% AMR? Uh, I think it's 100% for the OW ODSP. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, because we pay the difference yeah. in Greater Sudbury. So just to be clear, <laughs> in, my, in my world, <laughs> I can't speak for the other 46 in the province. <clears throat> Excuse me. So does the housing registry offer any other housing allowances for people with low income? So, so again, I just wanna be clear on, on, on job duties. So the registry um, uh, oversees the wait list and they determine eligibility. The registry doesn't offer anything other than what has been approved by city council, okay? And that comes through my office. So um, right now we have a program in Greater Sudbury uh, called the Social Housing Assistance Rental Program, SHARP is the acronym. This program is geared for ODSP recipients, seniors over the age of 65, and victims of domestic violence or human trafficking. Depending on the applicant household's source of income, the city assists with a maximum of $250 a month housing allowance, um, provided that the rent is lower than the average market rent. And again, average market rent, one bedroom is 921. In order to qualify for this portable housing benefit, uh, the applicant household must be active and remain active on the community housing wait list. So this is the difference with this program. This is more of a bridging program for those who are currently paying in core housing needs. So they're paying more than 30% of their income towards rent. So they're in core housing need and um, they, they would like to get into uh, a rent geared to income unit. So um, this, this is a, a housing allowance, $250 that we provide to that applicant household um, with the understanding that they must remain on the wait list. They must uh, remain in compliance with all the regulations associated with the wait list, which, which means the 30 day rule notifying us if there's a change of household composition. Every year there's an annual update completed, whether you're on the on the wait list or you're actually residing in community housing. Every year there is an annual update that needs to be completed in order to confirm that you remain eligible. So again, this is provincially legislated. So once someone is in uh, community housing, social housing, rent supplement, whatever, whatever type of unit it is, you still have to um, provide the housing provider when you're a tenant with your annual update. When you're on the wait list, you provide it to the registry that it's a one sheet page that you have a few attachments you have to attach. And this, um, this must be submitted on an annual basis, or if you're on the wait list and you don't submit, there's a few letters that will go out. It's about a, 
a 60 day process. Actually, it's longer than that because we give people a few months at the onset. It's probably a four month process that someone has to complete their annual update. If this is not done, your file's canceled. If you're a tenant and you do not comply with the annual update, you lose your subsidy. You go 90 days to market rent. So it's, it's something that's critically important to be completed so that you remain uh, eligible and you retain your subsidy. Um, the housing registry website shows you can apply for special priority and urgent status. Does the housing registry, however, have room to give priority and address homelessness or at risk of homelessness for those experience high barriers such as disability, deep poverty, living on OWODSP, racialization, oppression from being part of an Indigenous community or single parents? Uh, in, in a short answer, no, it does not. Registry staff do not have the capacity to authorize anything other than what they can determine through eligibility. Uh, we have the special priority, which is a provincial priority. So that's for folks who have resided with a um, and, and undergone, unfortunately, domestic abuse with, with a partner or someone who has been a victim of human trafficking. So those are the two areas that special priority is given. When someone receives the special priority placement, they um, they still have the option to select where they would like to live. And um, then they would go to the top of the wait list. So our regular wait, wait list is chronological based on date. Um, special priority, the individual would go to the top of the list for buildings that they've selected. Urgent status is, um, is for those folks who are homeless. And so in order to be considered eligible for urgent status, an African household must satisfy one of the following criteria. Persons who are living on the street, so they have no shelter, absolute homelessness, and accessing emergency homelessness services, or persons accessing temporary transitional housing services due to homelessness, um, or persons living in substandard housing, which has been condemned by the municipality. For example, property standards violations, which require that the unit be vacated in order to complete the work, confirmed by a court order or an order of the Ontario Rental Housing Tribunal, or persons using the emergency shelter system as their primary residence and accessing emergency homeless services, or persons whose homes have been destroyed by fire or natural disaster, or persons awaiting release from hospital who cannot return to their former place of residence and will not be released until suitable housing is found, or households whose children are at risk of apprehension or will not be returned by child protection agencies due to the household not having adequate housing and this is an and not an or the lack of adequate housing is the only protection issue outstanding so that is again right from legislation those those criteria um, so we have always found it better to 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 stick with what the legislation indicates as opposed to going off into gray areas where uh, there's too many variables. This leaves it very clean for my staff to determine. There are cases, extenuating circumstances that will come forward and they will be, uh, decisions will be made on a case by case basis. Next question, can somebody be on lists from different municipalities? How does this work? Applicant households can be on wait lists with different service managers across the province at the same time. However, each service manager has its own application process and they have their own wait list. So um, very, very different um, rules of engagement based on whatever municipality you are interested in residing in. So what happens in Greater Sudbury when a person with low income is evicted and can't afford rent on the private market? Is there a program of housing allowances to help them not fall into homelessness? So if that individual is on an OW or if they are low income, um, 
they can access the uh, chippy funding through social services or through the community um, nonprofit agency that is uh, in charge of community chippy funding. So as I indicated earlier, if someone has arrears, they are not eligible for social housing across the entire province of Ontario. So those, those arrears need, need to be uh, cleared up prior to them becoming eligible for any sort of subsidy um, for social community housing. Uh, does it happen in Greater Sudbury that an ODSP recipient gets the urgent status and thus priority access to community housing because of how disability and poverty interact and create vulnerability? Uh, no, they would get urgent status based on those, uh, those criteria that I just mentioned a few minutes ago. Again, it's, it's based on, on situation. Um, so that is what um, the urgent status uh, is, uh, how it's uh, determined. Is all community housing at RGI level? Uh, actually, no, it's not. So social housing, um, each of the um, um, housing providers have uh, service level standards and target plans that they have to meet. These, these target plans are based on, on uh, sustainability of the project. So uh, for instance, if it's a 20 unit building, they may have 12 units that are RGI and they have eight units that are market rent. So what they gain from their rents are what run the building. So essentially your, your, your budget needs to be sustainable. So you can't have 100% RGI in all community housing um, because of budget, you know, they, they would never survive. Um, that being said, municipal stock, so stock that is owned by the city of Greater Sudbury, which is called our local housing corporation, LHC, which is also known as Greater Sudbury Housing Corporation. That's stock that's owned by the, by the uh, municipality. That's 1,848 units. Those 1,848 are 100% RGI. How long does it take for an OW ODSP recipient who loses their housing to find new housing in Sudbury? Again, so this question is, is, has very many variables. Um, it depends if that individual has arrears. Uh, it depends if that individual is, is living somewhere already and, and, and could be in core housing need where they're paying more than 30%. It depends if that individual is uh, accessing the shelter system. So there's very, very many variables they, that, that would need to be considered when, so it's, it, it, you just can't answer this question, yes or no. It's, it's based on the individual situation be honest. Um, the province, uh, the provincial government is changing social assistance, unfortunately not to raise rates to livable levels, but instead so that it can prescribe life stabilization activities, services to its recipients, which will include referrals to housing services, health services, and employment services. Recipients, especially those struggling with health issues or disability, are very worried about this and about how this will affect entitlement to benefits. Municipalities are called to co-design these changes with the province. Is the housing registry involved in this? The housing registry would never be involved in this if it, I would be involved in it. So, so you got to remember that these are two programs and that I'm, I oversee as service manager, I oversee all the, all the programs. That being said, we are not involved in that. That is a social services um, division uh, task and responsibility. Social services is the division that oversees Ontario Works and ODSP components, not all of it, but some of it. So that division would be tasked with this um, social services uh, review. How old must one be to apply for seniors housing? Uh, typically at 65 years of age, we have some buildings in our federal uh, that if you are 50 and disabled, you can apply, but those are federal buildings only. So it, it, there, it does vary in a few of our buildings, but for the most part, it's 65. The last question I have here is a, is a very interesting one. Uh, the city of Sudbury sold some of its scattered community houses uh, stock to nonprofits some years ago. 
At least two artists were involved to help find nonprofits to buy them. Can you share how many houses were sold and if possible to whom and especially what has happened with the money collected from these sales? So in all my time here uh, in housing, um, I've never heard of any of our stock being sold. So I, I find this a very interesting question. So I'm not sure if whoever posed the question is on the line and might be able to perhaps provide me with a little more information. I can tell you that um, through our social housing revitalization plan that I spoke about earlier, we do have council's permission to sell our scattered units. And we've just started actually uh, in the month of August selling them. So we've sold three to date. The funds from the sale of these units will be going back into our social housing capital reserve to offset the costs of our Spark Street build where we're building the 14 units, as well as uh, in consideration of other future capital projects that uh, the municipality may, may take on. The, mis the municipality as well, uh, through our local housing corporation, has service level standards. So any units that we, have, that we sell, we have to replace that number. So with us building the 14 units in that one building, that allows us to sell 14 of our scattered units. So it, it, it's a trade one for one. Um, so that's, that's um, I'm not sure if that individual is on the line. Or... I, don't, I don't see anybody. Anyhow, so that, that I, if, if I could get more information, I'd be able to, uh, to uh, contact our planning and they could look up the address, but um, I, I am not at all familiar with, uh, with any of our stock being sold. As a matter of fact, I know that during my time here that we have not sold any in past years. So since I've been here. And those are all the, uh, those are all the great questions. I thank you very much. They were, they were awesome. I will uh, send this off uh, today so that uh, you can share it uh, so that people will have, have those responses in, in writing. Does anyone else have any questions that perhaps they would like to ask? I'm, I'm tempted to very spontaneously jump in and say that I would need to look at my notes more closely, but I feel that Sudbury might be more open to help ODSP recipients um, or at least recognize ODSP recipients particular vulnerability than Toronto is. So I'm thanking you for that. I'm not sure if I understood that um, you said that if an ODSP recipient, so let's say there's an ODSP recipient in core housing needs mm -hmm. um, and maybe health issues, would that person qualify automatically for the $2,050 allowance? No, it's, it's, it's $250. Uh, and, and it doesn't take into consideration any health issues. So we're not health, we're housing. So we, mm -hmm. we need to make that abundantly clear. We don't get funded through the Ministry of Municipal Affairs and Housing for any health related components. Okay, but let's say they're evicted, yeah. they're evicted. Yep. And they, 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 they are in need. So, right. do they so if someone's right. So if someone's evicted and they're in need, again, it's very specific. If they have arrears, those arrears need to be cleared up before they're even eligible. So that needs to, right off the hopper, that needs to be addressed. If, if they are living in an apartment and the, they are eligible for the um, housing allowance, which is the bridging program, so it's based on whatever their existing rent is. So if they're in a three bedroom, they're one person, they're in a three bedroom, they're paying $2,000 a month, they're not eligible. Oh, cool, you have cool, to be living cool. with like average market rent is 921. If your rent is 920 and you're in core housing need, we're going to help you. If, if you're in a unit that your rent is over the top, but you got to remember what you're paying in Toronto, your average market rent in Toronto is very different from what average market rent cool, in, cool. is in Sudbury, right? Yeah. That's just one of the, the, the key pieces. So you know, we, we don't tend to offer housing allowances to out of town people because you, you never qualify, to be honest, because the average market rent in Sudbury is so much less than the average market rent in Toronto. 
like Toronto's average market rent may be fifteen hundred dollars. I I don't know what it is. Yes, it is. It is fourteen hundred and thirty one when there calculated yes. by CMHC. Right. And it is eighteen hundred when calculated only on available rental units. So yes, the average market. But I I was not asking you whether I would qualify. Oh no no I understand that no I understand that I'm just saying that. That these are all the variables that play into it when we're when we are when we're having these really great discussions with applicant households, you know where they're living right now, what they're paying for rent. It, it this all is part and parcel of the of the good the relationships that we build with our applicants when we're when we're you know looking at all of these different variables. Mm -hmm. Okay, okay, and then maybe one more, and that's it. Um, Like I'm, I'm, I'm right now. I'm, I'm, I'm interested in whether people in your position sometimes take an advocacy role. Like the changes of social assistance at the moment are not good, and I'm wondering whether. Yeah, whether there is a discussion, and I don't know whether you can disclose, right? But if you can disclose that, whether there would be in your heart or like among your your collaborators to say, hey, like if there is pressure on us, because the pressure is going to come on you, right? If right. there is going to be pressure on you to house people in like two months where you don't have any housing. Um, but, the, but I don't ever, I have that pressure every day because I have a wait list of a thousand people. So you need to understand that I can only do what's within the confines of legislation. It doesn't matter what my heart says. If I, my heart says to house everybody, that's what my yeah, heart says. I understand, but, but, um, but the re but Cindy, regulations I, are changing. The regulations are changing. But not right my now. regulations. Social okay. assistance yes. are. That's so not I my, that's not my just, portfolio. I would just like to ask the question maybe in a different way. I'm just wondering... Um, as someone that works in the, that department, yeah. is there a communication, uh, is there uh, ways for you to communicate the needs and where there needs to be more attention put, either with the city or with the province that you could recommend? Is there like an uh, something that exists that permits the workers that work on the floor and know what is working or not. And if there's uh, departments that, my English is a little, no, your <laughs> not departments, perfect. but uh, yeah. my you know. uh, little uh, sections that are not being addressed of people right. that, uh, that could be addressed uh, stronger, more strong. <laughs> right, so, so please understand that, that, that both social assistance, I work very closely with individuals in Ontario Works. I work very closely with ODSP. I work very closely with pub public guardian trustee. I work very closely with children's services. We're all helpers. Mm -hmm. That's our role is to be helpers. That being said, we have to respect the legislation that surrounds these, these portfolios. Mm -hmm. we, we tell the province all the time. We tell them okay. all the time. This so there is, work. there is mechanism. There is no mechanism. Today. There is to share the information, but that's as far as it goes. They're the decision makers. That's the way the 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 the, the government yeah. works. Is that, you know, we receive provincial funding, we mm -hmm. receive uh, federal funding, we receive guidelines for that funding, and we spend it as we are uh, told to spend it. Mm -hmm. I go forward to the municipal uh, council. I make recommendations they approve them or they reject them. Mm -hmm. If they approve them, I move that forward. If they reject it, I can't. Okay. So I'm not a decision maker. I am the middleman that moves these things forward to the best of our ability within the confines of the legislation that, that is in place. So that is our role as middleman. That's why I say we're the middleman here. We, we have the regulations, we have, some of the rules are terrible. The going back, going to one offer was, it's insane. We, we fought hard. We said, no, let, let's at least do two instead of one. No, one. They, 
you can talk till you're blue in the face. When, when the senior levels of government have made the decision, it's like talking to the wall. It's unfortunate. I sit on probably three provincial tables where we're fighting hard. We're fighting hard for our folks because we don't agree with what's going on. Will we win? I, I hope we have some small wins at least. Mm -hmm. But but that's that's what we do. We we take the data back from our wait list. We take the data back from from that's why we did the seven background studies for our social housing revitalization plan. We have the data. We have the data that speaks to these issues. You know that my my wait list is 70% one bedroom and my stock is 40. That's a huge mismatch. Mm -hmm. That's why the portable housing benefits are so beneficial. Yeah. So we fight the fight for you folks. We do. Thank you. Thank so, uh, you. I think, I think was, you answered uh, my question, Cindy. Yes. I think my question yeah. was badly posed. And just like when I hear you say that you are at those tables and you're fighting for us, this is, my, this is the question I was asking, basically. Yeah, so yeah. thank we're you helpers. for that. Yeah, thank we're you. helpers. <laughs> We do, we do what we can. We, 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 we give, our, we give our, our best advice, which is based on data. It's not based on you know, the color of the sky today. It's based on, on, on information that has been gathered over time. Yes. It's historical data, it's financial data, mm -hmm. statistics, you know, benchmarks. We, 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 we push it all forward to show them, you know, that that this is the path you need to take, whether they choose to take that path. Yeah. So we do our best here. That's, that's all we can do. My staff work so hard every day. They're hard, hard workers. They're very compassionate people. And they, they do the best each and every day that they come into work. Oh yeah, it has often happened to me to imagine how much pressure you must have from both sides, right? When the legislation is so bad, then and you see those heartbreaking cases, you are really in in yeah, you are it's in tough. a sandwich position. So we I, are. I understand yes. that. Yeah, it's tough. Yeah. It is tough. Thank you very much, Cindy. You're very welcome. No, thank you. Is there anybody else that would have a question to ask uh, Cindy? Well, that was very uh, informative and I'm glad we did this together. Yeah. Um, well, thank you. Awesome. Thank you for allowing me the opportunity to, to speak about our little world here in Greater Sudbury in the, on the sixth floor of 199 Larch. Thank you very much. And <laughs> uh, yeah, I will, uh, I will send that uh, document off at some point today. Take care. Great, thanks. Okay, bye-bye. Thank you. So, so uh, for the others, I think uh, we, were think we were thinking in terms of taking a five minute break and then just a debrief after, if you feel like doing that, it would be great to, to hear you on what we just was just shared with us.